Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome back to many of you. And I, I see a few new faces, who uh, folks who were not here yesterday. Uh, we're here for the second of John Donne's series of Stimson lectures, Beyond the Democratic Maze. Um, his first lecture yesterday was called Diagnosing Democracy's Power, and his second today, Understanding Democracy's Ascent. Um, and then there will be two more next week, uh, same time, same place. Uh, next, next Tuesday, he will talk on recognizing democracy's disorientation. And then the final lecture, uh, this time next week on Wednesday, Recovering Our Bearings, Fatality, Choice, and Comprehension. Uh, a couple of prefatory remarks before I turn the podium over to Professor Dunn. As I think I, I mentioned yesterday, I first came across Dunn's work in a 1978 book that he wrote called Western Political Theory in the Face of the Future, which had a big impact on me for, for a lot of reasons. But um, something he said yesterday m made me just remember that a, a, a line in that book, which even though I, I looked for it today to confirm that I was right and I couldn't find it with the passage of 33 years and changing continents and all that, I somehow no longer have it. But there was a, there's a, a line etched into my consciousness in that book, which was that today we are all Democrats. We, we're all Democrats today, but democratic theory oscillates between two variants, one dismally ideological and the other hopelessly utopian. And I think that what he had in mind um, was the, for the dismally ideological was the sort of Schumpeterian minimalism that was, had sort of won the day in, in real politic at that time. And the hopelessly naive were the various variants of, of ideal speech theory and so on that were making the academic rounds. And he had very interesting things to say about those subjects, but what he did not address is what he's digging into in these lectures. He didn't address the question, why, why is it that democracy has become ascendant, particularly given that it has these unsatisfying features, um, some other dimensions of which he took up last time. Uh, and I think we're going to hear more about today. The second thought I had listening to, to Professor Dunn yesterday was um, how remarkable a lecturer he is. He reminds me of Henry James in that uh, he's able to, to speak in very long but nonetheless amazingly lucid sentences. And it's a real pleasure to li listen to him. And so uh, we're in for another treat, I think. John, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian, and thank all of you for being here. I tried yesterday to press home a picture of the singularity and mystery of democracy's rise to a global ascendancy, which, however much it may still be disputed, is unmatched by any previous category in human political experience. I did so mainly in order to make two points. The first is analytic and causal. It's that that victory has been throughout, in essence and in logic, a fundamentally political process, a political victory won by political means and through the mastering and deployment of political power in all its multifarious modes and configurations. As with any large-scale and protracted political process, much of the shape of the victory has issued from heuristics, from the seeking out and mobilizing of types and sources of force which were previously latent and unactualized. Historians can trace processes like that in retrospect with the incomparable privilege of hindsight but no one can reliably anticipate them because no one does or can know what is yet to be discovered. You can disagree indefinitely just why that's so, and I've no wish to pretend that the answer is steadily obvious to me. But what you can't sanely do is deny the overwhelming 
lesson of experience that it simply is so. The second point I want to make is cautionary and also essentially political, and it follows from the first. It's that there's great political danger in viewing democracy's current global presence as, any, as anything more elevated and predictably durable than a contingent and necessarily largely unself-transparent political outcome. More especially, there's great political hazard in seeing or sensing within it the reassuring potency imaginatively derived, but nonetheless causally efficacious, of something higher, purer, and safer, descending beneficently on politics from above, and soothing and softening the latter's insistent cruelties and absurdities, as it does so. You could say that that's an idle fear, since no one, and above all, no American, does or could see any real political process that way. And certainly, as a renegade historian of ideas, I'm not myself aware of any American who has ever been recorded as seeing American politics in action in their own vicinity uh, quite that way at any time. And no one, assuredly, could think of it as the illusion of the hour today. But the danger I want to point to, and which to which I'll return in my final lecture, is precisely that of failing to recognize democracy's global as ascendancy as an essentially political outcome, emanating from an essentially political process, no higher or lower in spiritual valency or existential security than any other political process, from the allocation of places on the US Supreme Court or Saudi Arabian arms contracts, congressional log rolling, or the adjustment of mafia franchises to the forging of the Red Cross or Amnesty International, the Society of Jesus, or the KGB. I don't, of course, mean that all political projects are the same or of equal value, just that every political process is political in the same way and that the dramatic variations in spiritual allure or material menace between them come at least as much from their ecological settings as from their specifications of collective goals. It's peculiarly easy for Americans to misconceive or fail to apprehend the political character of democracy's historical advance over the last three quarters of a century for two very different reasons, neither in any way damaging to the United States as a historical civilization or a political actor. In the first place, it's harder for Americans than it's always been for those at the receiving end to see clearly the coercive character of their own power in use, and hard accordingly for them to distinguish their severely contingent political winnings from their just deserts. In the second place, and despite the valiant efforts of America's political scientists for a good century by now, it's hard for them not also to sentimentalize the category of democracy itself and do so with a special ease and lack of inhibition as it passes from spaces where they can see for themselves and about which they know a great deal to larger spaces much further away about which they know virtually nothing. Why exactly should that be so? Well, I'm afraid I don't know. But one partial answer, perhaps, is the extraordinary weight of imaginative generosity and hope which so many of America's deepest and most passionate thinkers have poured into this category over the last two centuries. Barring a handful of preternaturally sensitive Puritan ministers, no one in North America poured anything much into the category of democracy before the middle of the 18th century. And extremely few had occasion even to mention it. But with the revolution, the forging of the new republic, and the long, usually amorphous, and always disturbingly incomplete struggle to rectify the anomaly of that muddled birth and fashion 
a decent and honourable form of shared life for all components of the people it brought into existence, democracy in due course came to be not merely the official regime name for the new republic, but also the vessel on which generations of America's most gifted and engaged writers, thinkers, and social activists lavished their aspirations for a shared habitat and media of existence for everyone fated and entitled to make their lives within it. In America's domestic politics, that great tide of energy and hope has been pretty effectively blocked for most of those 200 years. And it's not an adventurous judgment that it's effectively blocked today and likely to remain so for the near future. Quite deep domestic frustration and poorly comprehended external power each exert disturbing pressure on political judgment. And in combination, they make it especially hard for an American audience to see democracy's current political presence across the world steadily and accurately. What I want to do today is to step outside that imaginative force field and look at democracy's global ascent in a way which detaches it effectively from local political allegiance or appropriation. The approach I'm going to follow demands some defense at the outset, since many will see it, uh, as a number already have, as necessarily confused or futile. What I'm going to try to do is to track the passage of the term democracy across the world and between languages as it moves out beyond Europe uh, or its North American diaspora and to read the political interpretations it has evoked in the course of the dramatically disparate vicissitudes in which it's figured with increasing prominence across that ever-widening space. I'll do so by necessity impressionistically and episodically, and no one could mistake the result for serious intellectual history, since that history still needs to be done, country by country, language by language, decade by decade, and done by those already at ease enough with the contexts in question to fathom what has occurred within them. I see that huge and barely initiated collaborative task as just as urgent politically as it is intellectually. There are very radical antipathies and profound conflicts of interest in today's world, as there have been ever since we can see any distance into human history. But I believe those indubitable sources of danger to each and every one of us and all that we hold dear to be dwarfed in scale and acuity by the towering menace of our massive mutual ignorance and incomprehension. We don't understand the world which we so precariously share, and we don't understand it in very large measure because of the pitifully jejune degree to which we understand one another or grasp what virtually all the world's other inhabitants really care about or why they care about it as they do. If you see that as a fanciful judgment or a silly preciosity, just turn your minds momentarily to our twin invasions. I speak as a British citizen addressing an American audience. Our twin invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and the terrible harms that are still issuing inexorably from them. Still, even if you're gracious and patient enough to take seriously the judgment that there is a pressing need to understand the imaginative presence of those convulsive global encounters, what's the point of seeking to fathom anything about them by tracing the vicissitudes of a word? There are two elements to that point, one distinctly more obvious than the other. The first and obvious element is political, the extraordinarily highly perfected political valency of the term in question, the occasion for giving these lectures at all. But the second and less obvious element is essentially cognitive, or if you like, methodological. It's the vastly greater epistemic determinacy of what you place at the center of the process you seek to trace. 
The history of democracy as a word is an exercise in political philology, a severely underdeveloped intellectual practice, even in the wake of the linguistic turn, and one which in the fullness of time and pursued with the assiduity it requires and, and deserves, can and I hope will in due course draw on some of the huge cumulative intellectual capital of the shaping matrix of the Western mind over almost a millennium and bring that capital back into active political use. This isn't in any sense a narrowly Occidental intellectual project. It's just a, as deep a heritage to draw on from, it has just as deep a heritage to draw on from the civilizations of South Asia or of Islam, of Japan or Korea or above all China in Eastern Asia. Of the handful of scholars across the world whom I happen to know personally and know to be aware of the scale and promise of that task, figures like the Columbia Sanskritist Sheldon Pollock or the Princeton Islamicist Michael Cook, most, unsurprisingly, do emanate from or reside in the West. That's unsurprising because that's where I come from too. But there must always have been and will in the future assuredly be on a far greater scale counterparts with at least equal gifts and just as keen engagement who come from and remain within all the great centers of cultural creation and conservation across the world. What human beings can do in politics depends principally on the institutional structures within which they find themselves, sorry, the institutional structures which confront them and which are available to them and on the material environments within which they find themselves. But what they try to do and even what they choose to attempt depend every bit as much on how their imaginations work, on how they see and feel about themselves and about the human world which surrounds them at varying distances. It's because of its unmistakably consequential prominence within that space that we need so urgently to take in just what has been happening in and through the passage of this word across the globe over the last two centuries. What we need to look for within that passage, as I tried to suggest in yesterday's lecture, is the horizon of identification which it's held out to very many of them and the basis which it's offered them for discrediting and de denouncing their immediate enemies. I certainly don't want to suggest that it's invariably enhanced their political judgment or improved their political prospects by pressing those solicitations. Very often, no doubt, it's tantalized them with the promise of a power, control, and efficacy which were largely delusional and led them off defenseless to the slaughter like some huge global after echo of the Children's Crusade or replay of Passchendaele. You might, I think, bear that point in mind, at, at that point, bear in mind the miseries of Libya today. But however vulnerable that promise may prove, the power to move very large numbers of human beings is a formidable political force in itself, and it's hard to overstate the motivating power of the strictly political services which this drab little word has seemed to them to offer to endless millions of frightened and suffering people, or to exaggerate the scale of the consequence of its carrying that force. To look at political experience through the carriage of power by a word is to view politics from a very odd angle, and one which by itself could scarcely equip anyone to understand a great deal about it. Most people today don't think of democracy in the first instance as a word. They view it as a form of government or an assemblage of institutional practices. In this country, less hesitantly than anywhere else in the world, they think of it as their form of government and the assemblage of practices which currently defines that. When they ask about the presence or absence of democracy elsewhere in the world, what they principally have in mind 
is the presence in varyingly distant settings of reasonably good facsimiles of that form of government and of practices which appear to express more or less congruous values and commitments to those which are deemed to inform their own, at least when the latter is on its best behavior. When they go on to inquire how that form of government has come to prevail to the degree that it has in many areas of the world, or even why it initially arose in their own country and elements of it had arisen earlier and elsewhere, they look at the formation of states, the techniques of political control, the genesis of resources from human populations and their mobilization by rulers or local power holders, the bases on which groups of human beings can be induced to cooperate or comply with the requirements pressed on them from above. And those pictures can be cool, detached, and comfortably cosmopolitan. They can read history without disclosing local allegiances within it or assuming that it carries a, a um, legitimatory moral which favors some and disfavors others today or tomorrow. Approaches like that make it possible to ask how politics works and doesn't work and why it takes broadly the forms it now does without pre-committing the questioner to reaching answers that are supportive or even comfortable for anyone at all. There are good reasons for the existence of political science as an intellectual genre and a professional practice. But as soon as you ask which of those forms of government or practices or presumptive purposes and informing principles have merit and deserve allegiance, the hard-won professional composure of political science is instantly ruffled, and the sense of coherent inquiry and even of consecutive good sense soon comes into serious jeopardy. Consider the question of whether it really was the Greeks who invented democracy, where many contemporary Greek citizens emphatically wish to affirm the positive answer, and serious and exhaustively informed students of democracy's history on the other side of the world feel it every bit as essential to insist on a negative one. Those who affirm the positive answer principally wish to claim for their own a historical experience in some ways glittering enough, in others as ugly uh, as the historical experiences of every other human community, which happens to have occurred more or less where they now live and to have been enacted principally through a language intriguingly continuous with their own. That's an innocent enough appropriation, and it's not notably more ingenuous than most communities' appropriations of their own from always fairly discrepant pasts. What irks, the what irks the critics of Greek claims to be democratic originators isn't the innocent narcissism of contemporary Greeks. It's the appropriation of effectively the same claim on Greece's behalf by the remainder of Europe and its potent and wealthy diaspora across the oceans. Hence the counterclaim that any specifiable element of what came to be called democracy had been prefigured or pre-named in other roughly adjacent settings, especially in continental Asia, before the Greeks came to adopt it. It hasn't so far proved possible to trace anything very clear or illuminating of what was or wasn't going on in the favored settings, Mesopotamia, Phoenicia, and so on, let alone to pin down its local political significance or demonstrate that it had definite consequences for what the best recorded of Greek communities did to and through the category of democracy. But there's no reason whatever to dispute the passage of cultural and intellectual elements from a wide variety of non-Greek societies and polities to Greek polis in the epoch in which the term democracy first came into recorded use or of the possibility of extensive Greek imitation and experimentation on the basis of earlier and clearly non-Greek practices and expedients. But it's hard to believe in either case that those are the right questions to ask. Human beings have had to devise ways of 
taking and lending authority to binding collective decisions on the varying scales on which they've lived together across the world, and for far longer than we have careful or reliable descriptions of how they did so. It's scarcely conceivable that there could have been a distinctive and uniquely compelling approach to doing so, which occurred to one set of human beings speaking one language in one place and at one time, but comprehensively failed to occur to any others elsewhere earlier or later. It's certainly impossible to believe that the practice of assembling together to discuss in public what to do didn't on different scales and bases arise and persist in every humanly inhabited consonant and do so well before we have legible records of how its inhabitants dealt with one another on any scale at all. And it's merely ludicrous to imagine that we ourselves have somehow chanced upon a vision of how to ensure that when we do assemble together in person, virtually, or by proxy to discuss in public what to do, we now have at our disposal any more radiantly compelling a conception of how that discussion can be conducted in practice on a basis which is legitimately disconcerting to no one. What the Greeks did originate was a word, and a word through which, whatever its semantic correlates in other languages beforehand, a lot of dramatic political life occurred within a wide range of Greek polis, and most flamboyantly and articulately in Athens itself. It was that flamboyance and articulacy, whimsically frozen in text, which enabled that word to survive the demise of an independent Athens, and even of the cities of the eastern and central Mediterranean, which preserved many of its political forms in outline for many centuries to come. It survived not as an ideological force or a glowing emblem of power, but as an instrument for thinking. It served for thinking, to be sure, about ideological force and about the sources and modalities of power and the unsteady relations between power, benign political purposes, and beneficial political consequences. But it emphatically didn't guarantee the benignity or efficacy of power in use or serve in anyone's eyes as assurance of the purity of political purpose. Nor did it suggest any elective affinity between the regime form to which it referred and the successful pursuit of cognitive validity. If anything, the relation it suggested between this particular regime form and either political merit or cognitive insight was more disjunctive than it was mutually supportive. The fact... I'll avoid the cheap joke there, <laughs> just. The fact that the single most widely dispersed and potent term in political speech across the world today, and in that sense because of the relentless growth in the numbers of living humans, the most poli potent political term there's ever been, survived in today is into today's world at all, not as a focus of political loyalty or a normative aspiration, but as an instrument of thought, is as startling as it is important. But that fact, of course, does nothing to explain either why or how it has come to be so widely dispersed, or politically so potent. The grasp those who have to look at the political history of the world over the time span in which it has spread so widely and picked up such political momentum. You have to watch the word carefully as it enters the political repertoire of one country after another, picking up friends and enemies as it goes, and helping to recompose political coalitions and reshape political enmities as it does so. Look at the world in 1750, and you can barely see it present even in heated discussions between handfuls of politically motivated intellectuals, like Jonathan Israel's emblematic radical heroes trudging manfully forwards in the footsteps of Spinoza. Look at it as it leaves the maelstrom of France's revolution and the ravages of Napoleon's wars of conquest. And already it seems to have 
hitched its colors to the huge inchoate movement of egalitarian reconstruction that shaped so much of the next century and three quarters, but which has now been all but extirpated as an imaginative and energizing political force. Whilst that movement, call it socialism, was still expanding territorially in however erratic a manner, it fully retained the potential to set a drastically different frame and valency on the idea of democracy, and to impose that frame, however clumsily and brutally, on the experience of immense numbers of human beings. But in that form, the tide has long ebbed decisively, and all that's left in the word itself is a pallid ghost of the power it once held. What has carried that word so far up the global beach today is to an overwhelming degree one thing, the role it came to play in explaining America's politics to itself. There's still no very illuminating account of exactly how and why it came to play that role, so I think Sir Sean Wilentz's American Freedom comes closer en passant than anyone else yet has. But there is, as I understand it, reasonably clear agreement amongst informed scholars that the movement for American independence and the subsequent construction of the new republic were in neither case in any sense political struggles conducted under the banner of democracy or intended by almost anyone, James Wilson being probably the most important ex exception, to establish that republic as a regime appropriately conceived in the round as a democracy. In 1776, democracy was simply not a banner word. It was still in close touch with the cool analytical perspective on political existence which had launched it on its lengthy post-Athenian historical career and which continued to confine it to narrowly academic or intellectual circles for over 2,000 years. Even within that milieu, it wasn't viewed as a plausible solution to the pressing problems of any community of any scale which recognized itself willingly or otherwise to face pressing problems. It was simply not the solution to the riddle of anyone's history. Within a more analytical perspective, to be sure it could be employed and sometimes was employed to refer to properties of the new American regime by those who hoped to usher it into safe and durable existence. In other contexts, some of those apparently positive observers, notably Alexander Hamilton, elsewhere expressed, whether before or afterwards, a visceral hostility to the political arrangements and turmoil which the word evoked for them and which they expected it to arouse in most of their audience. What held the movement for independence together was a hostility to being subjected to imperial power and authority from the other side of the ocean. In a few relatively sophisticated cases, its implications soon came to be seen as explicitly republican, hostile by commitment to monarchy as such. For John Adams, as early as the spring of 1776, there is no good government but what is republican view he went on in due course to fill out at considerable length. But for less decisive and theoretically relentless participants, democracy was certainly no proxy for a republic and it was seen as carrying very specific dangers of its own. For those with very large stakes in the country, simple democracy was close to pure threat. In Maryland in the same year, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, one of the richest men in North America, saw the prospect of the simple democracies he believed his fellow constitution makers intent on establishing as the worst of all forms of government and bound to end as all other democracies have in despotism. For James Madison, from the 10th Federalist onwards, the prospects for stabilizing and consolidating the new republic rested not on provenly erratic models drawn from a distant Greek past, 
but on the design of a novel model by a small number of gifted, experienced, and dedicated figures with the political weight and prowess to carry, carry their fellow Americans with them. The great body of supporters or opponents of the new constitution, he insisted, must follow the judgment of others, not their own. A fortunate coincidence of leading opinions and a general confidence of the people in those who may recommend it. It was that judgment which lay behind his contributions to the Federalist. By the fourth decade of the next century, when Tocqueville settled down to work out and proffer to the world his own incomparable construal, the new republic had unmistakably embraced democracy in name as well as in substance. Once it had chosen republican independence in place of what it had come to see as imperial subjection, it had little real alternative open to it. There were rich families in the ex-colonies and there were plainly, as there always have been, social pretensions to go along with their wealth. But by 1776, there was nothing there which anyone could durably mistake for an aristocracy. And what dispersed residues of gentility and condescension remained were manifestly incapable of setting their stamp upon the new political order. In the end, despite a few early panics, none even made a serious attempt to. If unmistakably a republic and a markedly unaristocratic republic at that, what was there for their new regime to be but a democratic republic? And a democracy in due course it duly became, both in its own eyes and until much later when it met the disapproving gaze of more belligerently holistic egalitarians in Europe or beyond in the eyes of everyone else who chose to inspect it. You can disagree, as most now do, I think, with Louis Hartz in seeing that outcome as imparting a distinctive shallowness to American political understanding, which in turn reflected its relatively narrow horizon of social and economic experience. But what you can't readily deny is since his insistence that one of its principal consequences was to ensure that the sharpest ideological conflict over the legitimacy of the new order came over its compatibility with a system of unfree labor, which required the laborers in question to be excluded from citizenship. That wasn't an outcome which would have discomfited interpreters of democracy in the communities which first gave referential meaning to the term. But if the war between the states had come out differently, it would have had drastic implications for the global prospects of America's model of democracy in its struggle with professed partisans of equality across most of the rest of the world. Whatever it may have felt like to some of its inhabitants with a fluent repertoire of denial, a slave society can't readily be seen from the outside as a system of political equality. It's hard to exaggerate the degree to which the global ascendancy of democracy as a category of political aspiration has come from the competitive appeals of equality over against those of hierarchy as a category of political identification. Both economic and social equality have further appeals of their own, and it will always remain an open question just how far political equality requires either economic or social equality to be rendered real, and just how far the challenge of economic organization precludes the realization of even the most rudimentary elements of either economic or social equality, except at prohibitive cost. <coughs> to see what's happening to, through, and around the category of democracy, as it moves from Europe and North America into other continents, it's necessary to recognize not merely what governmental forms or sequences of experience it's taken to refer to, but also what forms of equality it's heard to threaten or promise, and what types of economic structure are seen to be compatible with it or precluded by it. 
everywhere that democracy now reaches has sooner or later to learn how to answer those questions through its own framework of understanding on the basis of its own political and economic experience and with its own immediate predicament in the forefront of its mind. The resulting political process is always extraordinarily complicated. There are brief passages of specious clarity in which the problems of mutual intelligibility apparently drop away and one regime form collapses with another and plainly superior briskly replacing it. The Orange Revolution forming perhaps the most prominent recent example. But it never takes long for intrinsic political interpretive complexity to reassert itself and the fog banks to roll back in and cut political visibility down to size. Since I take <coughs> that cognitive constriction not as an intellectual failure on the part of the present membership of our species or our academic professions, a failure that might in principle be remedied by future enhancements of our performance but rather as an ontological feature of the world, given by where and what we are, I see no possibility of moving briskly beyond it, though I certainly hope we may eventually learn to live, to live it with better grace and mutual forbearance. As an exercise in training such forbearance, it may help to dwell on one or two of the great historic regime collapses and reconstructions on other continents which have reshaped the global structure of power over the last century. For most of that century, it would have been natural to begin with Russia, but the indisputable failure of that notable, if clumsily conducted, experiment has rendered the task of understanding what ensued in it less urgent without making it any easier to discharge. At least for the present, it seems more urgent to improve our grasp of what has been going on in the contrasting adventures of the category in two other great societies so far confined to Asia as a landmass. In one of these, as a part residue of Britain's Indian Empire, the category has been interpreted primarily in response to the political conduct and heritage of the former imperial power though, of course, it's been interpreted very dynamically indeed. And I suppose, if admittedly with later and not overwhelmingly instructive supplementation from Russia and China, but, but in the other, in China, encounter with democracy as a practical feature of the political world from the outset prompted more attention to America's idiosyncratic political experience. By great good fortune, one of the subtlest and most illuminating accounts of the process through which the rest of the world has had to try to fathom the promise and menace lurking in this obtrusively Western category is provided in an article I was lucky enough to have had pressed on me the last time I was in Yale for any length of time by your extraordinarily distinguished historian of China, Jonathan Spence. The article was written by a Chinese scholar, uh, whose name I'm sure I can't pronounce, but spelt Zhang Yuji, summarizing work which he'd undertaken over several decades. It focuses on the inherent difficulties faced by Chinese officials, scholars, and journalists when they first tried to grasp what American democracy was, and the closely connected difficulties which foreign missionaries or journalists also encountered when they too tried to convey their own understandings of its practical character and self-interpretation to Chinese readers or audiences. Some of those difficulties were essentially difficulties of translation in linking the words of one language elaborated to understand and operate one set of political practices in one kind of society to those of another language developed to articulate and enact a very different set of practices in another and drastically different kind of society. It's a very broad space to try to cross. In the Chinese case, as the most talented interpreters of China's modern intellectual history have long demonstrated with great finesse, 
the language into which the translation had to be made was peculiarly ill-suited to registering the point and character of barbarian political practices because it had come to be so heavily impacted on a millennially reiterated and consolidated vision of the political preconditions for civilization itself. The order of the celestial empire was implacably hierarchical. It privileged peace and obedience to a single apex of authority. It viewed conflict, dissidence, and still more active resistance with acute suspicion, at least until those responses had receded a tactful distance into the past. And it saw the order which it promised and aspired to provide as resting principally on the commitment and insight not merely of the emperors themselves and the personnel of the court through which they exercised their sway, but also of the scholar officials and cultivated gentry throughout the provinces who sustained them and aspired to refine and edify their judgment. When the denizens of that highly differentiated and sometimes strongly intellectually engaged milieu first took up the challenge of attempting to comprehend barbarian political practices, their eye was firmly on power, on the peremptory need to turn the tables on the ever more intrusive, graceless, and disruptive traders and gunboats from the West. They sought to grasp where the power which was relentlessly molesting them had come from and what it rested on in order to draw on its sources directly for themselves. Since the agencies which menaced them had only the haziest comprehension of the answer themselves, it was bound to prove a lengthy and disconcerting quest. And even after the Chinese Communist Party's triumphal assumption of power in 1949, it remains far from clear how much real progress in ascertaining an answer had been made in China until Deng Xiaoping's decisive intervention. And even then, the answer he hit upon was explicitly pragmatic and agnostic over issues of political, economic, or cultural choice. Any style of cat, provided it catches the mice. If you inspect the current battlefront in that very long-running war of position, the role of democracy is very striking. To American observers, all but inevitably, it's a category which challenges the political standing of the Chinese Communist Party and the legitimacy of all who have risen to power through it. It hovers permanently on the brink of repudiating Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan, over Tibet, over Xinjiang, and if the People's Republic ever runs into big trouble and regional warlording recommences, potentially over any substantial segment of the country. From the viewpoint of China's rulers, it's a summons to revolution, to anarchy, or at very least to a dissipation or rupture of the power so triumphantly accumulated in the years since 1979. To associates of the incumbent government, it's a category to which they've already taken the precaution of helping themselves. Whose republic, after all, is it, if not the people's? Deployed by their foreign critics or by state enemies, it indicts them for fraud or wrongful possession of what was never rightfully theirs. Now, that's clearly a disagreement about very many things. It ranges far and wide, it evokes considerable animosity, and it implicates pressing interests on both sides, though perhaps clearer and less readily admissible, strictly personal stakes on the Chinese side. Whose republic is it indeed? At a minimum, it's a disagreement about how it's appropriate for a society to, to acquire its leaders how far those leaders should be subsequently left unimpeded to act as they judge fit, what affects the degree of discretion open to them in acting out their roles are likely to have on the scruple or self-restraint with which they choose to do so, and what effects 
the presence or absence of external scrutiny and personal accountability can be expected to exert on the benign or maleficent impact of their governing on those at the receiving end. Those are a lot of issues to seek to organize through a single and somewhat nebulous concept. And it's scarcely surprising that the resulting disputes often prove dialogues of the deaf and virtually never much clarify the viewpoints of either party. You can see that plurality of issues either analytically or politically. Viewed analytically, it remains intractably plural, and any political comprehension it contrives to provide is necessarily provisional and hypothetical, a kaleidoscope which shifts its patterns drastically every time you alter the angle at which you choose to hold it. And seen politically, it can, of course, be every bit as plural and explicitly relative to the position and engagements of the individual or group who happens to be looking at it. But when it's viewed politically, it can also be summative, a judgment or choice, above all, about where the weight of a regime's political credibility does or should rest. And it's over that last assessment that not merely America's leaders, but most of its politically interested population are so deeply at odds, not just with China's current political leaders, but also, as far as we can currently ascertain, with most of China's politically interested population, too. Remember the anticipated response of Iraq's population to being rescued by shock and awe. The American conviction, which now seems to reach back uninterruptedly to 1776, comes above all from a process, the manner through which America's leaders come by their authority. No one inspecting the United States today could sanely conclude that it is governed by its people. But a handsome majority of those who do in some sense govern it today, as throughout that impressive time span, have obtained or retained the opportunity to do so, whether directly or by delegation, by courtesy of the people. That's not a claim which can <coughs> plausibly be defended for China at any point in its vastly longer history. Across the stark and sometimes violent disagreements over what the people have authorized or should authorize it to do, and however squalid, confused, and misguided they believe that sequence of choosing to have been, Americans stand more or less united in the proud conviction that any authority their own government has ever possessed to do anything has come to it through the free choice of the people. From the confidence and serenity of that viewpoint, it's hard for Americans, through all their domestic fears, humiliations, crimes, and sufferings, <coughs> not to view the political predicaments of most of the world with some degree of condescension. Nothing infuriates the people of China across all their brutal political and personal inequalities more than barbarian condescension. Hence the feebleness of the impulse simply to accept as a unique and decisive validation a criterion of conspicuously barbarian provenance the Chinese aren't going to be reconciled to anything by news from pre-Confucian Mesopotamia, a criterion which fetishizes a process through which those who currently rule China have plainly not obtained their own opportunity to do so. Evidently enough, the implied relative evaluation of the standing of the respective states would hardly be acceptable to China's current rulers. But it's just as important to recognize the oddity through the prism of China's vastly lengthier political experience of this entire way of conceiving the relative strength and weaknesses of the two regimes. It's not as yet plausible, at any rate to me, to suppose that China's experience may somehow secrete within it a conception of the responsibilities and character of the modern state <coughs> 
which is potentially sounder and more powerful than the one which eventually emerged from Europe's largely self-inflicted political torments. But humans are a very intellectually inventive species, and it would be ill-advised as well as impolite to rule the possibility out in advance. And even if Chinese political construals are unlikely in the short term to offer a superior wholesale replacement for American political understanding, it's far less evident that they may not already present elements which might help to balance the latter somewhat better and reframe contemporary judgments about what is or is not to be done by whom across the world in a less unpromising fashion. The American critique of China's present state, always latent, though mercifully not always clearly audible in public, or I imagine even in private dialogue between the two, is basically that China's rulers have come by their authority through a process which couldn't stand inspection, that it provides no clear or reliable restraints on how they deploy that authority, leaves them minimally and whimsically accountable personally and wholly unaccountable corporately to those over whom they exercise it, furnishes them with no predictably potent or edifying grounds to exert it with due consideration for the interests of those whom they rule, fails with any consistency to equip them with the understanding or information required to recognize what those interests really are, and therefore comprehensively fails to protect their subjects, China's alleged citizens, against the full impact of those rulers' indiscretion, cynicism, greed, or stoniness of heart. Shade less confidently, quite a lot less plausibly, but also mercifully somewhat more mutably, it goes on to suggest that those incumbents have proved very poor custodians of the interests of those whom they rule and by implication, far worse custodians than their American counterparts have contrived to prove themselves in the altogether seemlier and better conceived political architecture in which history has privileged them to operate. It's important to think through to that last point in the analytical sequence because it brings out the all but compulsive lack of balance in America's perspective on China and the consequent potential gain of rebalancing American political comprehension by what it's not ludicrously overstrained to think of as Chinese political comprehension. Though, of course, it's in no sense a form of comprehension exclusive to China. Until that final point in the analytic sequence, by necessity a moment of summation, there's no mistaking the force of Sorry. <coughs> There's no mistaking the force of the American critique of China's existing state. Indeed, you can pick up most elements in that critique sooner or later in more sporadic and dispersed fashion in the Chinese state's own discourse with itself and its own subjects. A state of which all that's true, and much of it even apparent to the state's own custodians and champions, is manifestly not a well-ordered state in good political health. Very plausibly, it's an ill-ordered state in a fairly advanced degree of corruption. And yet, it's that state which has changed China more drastically than any previous state has ever changed the life chances of populations of distantly comparable size at anything like that pace. Much appalling harm has been perpetrated over those three decades, but there can hardly be a sane person in the world who could honorably will for China to turn the clock back to 1979. How much better is the United States in the round than it was in 1979? And for just whom is it clearly better on balance? Democracy in the American understanding is not a talisman for ensuring satisfactory political outcomes, and it's both imprudent and wrong to offer it to others as though it were. A balanced assessment of the relative merits of two very different societies' political arrangements 
is a precarious and taxing undertaking at the best of times. But as political experience globalizes uncontrollably, it's going to have to be undertaken more and more frequently and with ever-growing urgency. Where the two societies in question are already incipiently vying for world power, and each can only view itself as the consummation of a long, proud history or jeopardize its sense of identity by acknowledging irreparable hiatuses within that history, the intrinsic difficulty of the comparison itself is painfully exacerbated. To recognize China's formidable political strengths is already to begin to impugn America's political self-assurance, a step which is relatively effortless, naturally, for China's rulers and which many have quite audibly taken. For China's current rulers, whatever they feel about one another personally, they are corporately the source and basis of whatever order does exist in and across China. There is no independent surviving source of order and no external basis on which they or anyone else could readily set out to construct one. To choose to jeopardize that already highly imperfect and conspicuously vulnerable order would, in the classic phrase of Edmund Burke, be to play a most desperate game. What could give China's present rulers sufficient reason to embark on that game? More pressingly, what should give them such a reason? Certainly not the imperative to treat their own subjects better or enhance their net welfare as effectively as they can, duties they in effect fully acknowledge already in the breach, if not in the observance, at least abstractly, and duties which they can only coherently hope to address by focusing and deepening the power of the state they currently head. When Chinese officials first attempted to grasp what American democracy was over a century and a half ago, they focused in turn on three questions. What exactly was the apex of the American state? How did it get there and what kept it there? And what effects on the ways it subsequently acted did the way in which it got there really exert? It was the last of those three, the predictable effects of the mechanisms for attaining political power, which first attracted serious Chinese appreciation. But it did so at a point where there was no realistic possibility of China adopting the same model. In the lengthy interval since then, None of those questions has lost interest, and all three have gained in apparent significance from America's rise to world power. Now, as then, the answers to the first two questions exerted little competitive pressure on Chinese visions of the basis and value of China's order. I'll begin my first lecture next week by showing how rapidly the answer to that third question how the ways in which individuals come to rule affect the ways in which they do rule, began to press on those visions. And I'll try to set the political configuration which emerged from that comparison against the type of political challenge that American democracy now poses to the legitimacy of China's state and the corresponding solace which the American and the Indian states each now draw from the common element in their authorizations.